The mayor of the Colombian capital has denounced excessive use of force by police as at least 10 people were killed in protests. The French president has described Turkey's moves in the eastern Mediterranean as unacceptable. The Lebanese president has stressed that those responsible for a huge fire at the port of Beirut will be held accountable. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Colombia where at least 10 people have been killed as the streets of the capital, Bogota, descended into chaos following the police killing of Javier Ordonez. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, the 46-year-old father of two was repeatedly beaten and tasered by police officers for allegedly violating quarantine rules. He was taken into custody but later died in hospital. Protests against police brutality, as well as the spike in violence in rural areas of the country, swept the city and riot police were deployed as the clashes became increasingly violent and spread to other cities across the country. Seven deaths were reported in the capital, while three were reported in Soacha, a municip municipality close to Bogota. In addition, at least 55 people visited hospitals after being injured by blunt objects. Meanwhile, local mayors have denounced the excessive use of force by the police and noted that officers used their firearms in the midst of the clashes with demonstrators. And the mayor of the city of Bogota, Claudia Lopez, has denounced the use of weapons and excessive force by police against protesters. Mr. Commander-in-Chief of the National Police, Mr. President, not only should these events be investigated by an independent body that guarantees justice, but that the recruitment, training protocols and methods of investigating cases of police abuse be structurally reformed. And Lopez also called on President Ivan Duque to undertake a comprehensive reform of the national police in the face of frequent episodes of violence. From the Bogota Mayor's Office, we can confirm that last night there was an indiscriminate use of force, not police abuse, indiscriminate use of force, of firearms in several points of the city by members of the police, who of course did not have any authorization to use those weapons, nor to respond in such a manner. In Venezuela, different political parties have defined their candidates in the lead up to the parliamentary elections of December 6. We have more details in the following report. Representatives of the national political parties came to the National Electoral Council for the act of choosing their location on the ballot. The National Election Council, for the purpose of publicizing the election offer, must call upon organizations with political purposes to take a position on the ballot. The order is given by the vote obtained in the previous process, determines a guide for the voters. The card varies as regional and indigenous parties are included. A solid block remained at the top left side of the parties of the revolution, and the rest of the parties disintegrated at the lower right side. It is one of the mandatory stages of this schedule. Participants called on the population to have confidence in the process and to join the elections in December. To walk the electoral path as the way to the solution of the serious problems Venezuela faces today, the country demands national unity. It demands solutions and that is only possible if we manage to resolve our conflicts with the vote as an instrument of struggle for all Democrats. The various political parties continue to negotiate in the search for alliances that will boost the vote on December 6. Brazilian authorities have reported 1,075 COVID-19 deaths in the last 24 hours, pushing the total death toll to almost 129,000. Meanwhile, the total number of confirmed cases has surpassed 4.2 million after over 35,000 new cases were reported in the past 24 hours, according to the latest report from the Ministry of Health. Meanwhile, over 3.4 million people have recovered from the virus, representing more than 80% of patients affected by COVID-19. And the World Health Organization has criticized the Brazilian government's lack of measures to curb the spread of the coronavirus. United Nations rapporteur Baskut Tunkak announced a report would be presented highlighting those states that have committed human rights violations in the handling of the pandemic, among them Brazil, where the UN has noted that irresponsible economic and social policies put millions of lives at risk.
Cuba participated this Thursday in a virtual forum of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, devoted to discussing the complex scenario facing Caribbean countries in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The virtual session of ECLAT's Caribbean Development and Cooperation Committee was held this Thursday afternoon and Deputy Minister of Foreign Trade and Investment Deborah Rivas participated on behalf of Cuba. Representatives of member states of the committee analysed the regional perspectives based on the adoption of creative and lasting solutions for the recovery following COVID-19 according to the meeting agenda. French President Emmanuel Macron urged fellow European leaders on Thursday to stand up to the Turkish government and what he called its unacceptable provocations in the eastern Mediterranean. The statements came as Turkey seeks to expand its energy resources and influence in the region. Leaders of European Union countries that border the Mediterranean Sea were holding an emergency summit in Corsica amid fears of an open conflict with Turkey stemming from mounting tensions over its offshore oil and gas drilling plans. Turkish leaders have lashed out at France and the EU for siding with Greece and Cyprus in the dispute. Greece and Turkey have deployed naval and air forces to assert their competing claims over energy exploration rights in the eastern Mediterranean. At the Corsica summit, France pushed to resume German mediation in the dispute. Meanwhile, Russia also offered to mediate earlier this week. The World Health Organization on Thursday noted that the suspension of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine trial was a wake-up call that vaccine development is not always a fast and straightforward path. I think this is a good, um, perhaps a wake-up call or a lesson for everyone um, to recognize the fact that there are ups and downs in research, there are ups and downs in clinical development, and, and we have to be prepared for those. Um, it's not always a fast and a straight road. But we don't need to be overly discouraged because these things happen. And we have to wait for the determination by the Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, on this particular case and then what the next steps are going to be uh, for this vaccine trial. And we hope that, that things uh, will be able to move on. But again, it depends. It depends on a lot and we have to wait to see the details um, of what actually happened. The collapse of primary health care in Spain has sparked concern among patients and medical professionals who are demanding greater investment in the face of an imminent wave of infections caused by the novel coronavirus. More in the following report. Long lines. This is the image of the medical centers in Spain in the face of the coronavirus crisis. The lack of personnel has left the public health system very affected, and the citizens hardly go to the routine checkups or primary care in the face of the collapse. We have to wait for the doctor or someone else to call us. They give us a number and then call us whenever they feel like it. This is getting worse every day. Gabriela is waiting at the door of a health center to receive a prescription. She has been going there for four days trying to get an appointment to renew the medicine she has run out of. And she has not been successful, neither by phone nor in person. To bring more doctors in and treat in dry conditions because if we come here sick, suffering a heart attack or having something wrong with the heart or back, there is no one here to treat us. I'm telling you this because I saw it happen yesterday. I have already come to see the doctor and for the fourth time, and they tell me to call back through internet. I won't do it anymore. They have to treat me because I pay my social security. Unions regret the lack of investment in primary care, where testing is carried out and 80% of COVID-19 cases are detected by PCR testing, and where more than 20,000 health workers are needed. From CCO, we demand that the expenditure on primary health care should be 25% of the total, which has happened after the pandemic that everything we have been denouncing has become worse. Lack of professionals, lack of diagnostic means, lack of a response to the citizens. That is why we continue to insist that more people should be hired. The fear of another great wave of contagion is beginning to overwhelm the health workers in the hospitals where almost 2,000 people have been hospitalized due to coronavirus in the last seven days. 
Germany's Disease Control Centre reported 1,892 new coronavirus cases this Thursday. The total number of cases registered in the country now stands at over 255,000, while more than 9,000 people have lost their lives. The Robert Koch Institute noted that coronavirus outbreaks are being reported in various settings, especially celebrations with family and friends and at group events. The number of newly reported cases in Germany declined from about mid-March to the beginning of July. Since then, the number of cases has increased, but has stabilised over the past week, according to the centre. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's London extradition hearing was suspended this Thursday as one of the lawyers involved may have been exposed to the COVID coronavirus. District Judge Vanessa Raritza ordered the proceedings to be adjourned until Monday, while a lawyer representing the United States government is tested for the virus. Assange is fighting US prosecutors' attempt to get the British government to extradite him in order to stand trial on espionage charges. US prosecutors have indicted the 49-year-old Australian on 18 espionage and computer misuse charges over WikiLeaks' publication of classified US military documents a decade ago. The charges carry a maximum sentence of 175 years in prison. Prominent journalists, activists, lawyers and human rights defenders have stressed that the case is a clear example of the clampdown on press freedom. Bulgarians once again took to the streets of the capital on Thursday to continue anti-government protests which have been ongoing for two months. Thousands have joined the daily rallies in downtown Sofia to demand the resignations of Prime Minister Boyko Borisov and Chief Prosecutor Ivan Geshev. On Thursday, protesters packed the square between the buildings of the government and parliament, which were cordoned off of a huge police presence. Bulgaria's President Ruman Radev is backing the protests by calling on the centre-right cabinet of Borisov and Geshev to step down. On Thursday, Radev said in a Facebook post that the stubbornness of the two politicians was only worsening the crisis and reiterated his call on protesters not to give in to provocations. The Red Cross has stressed that evacuating refugees from Lesbos and other Greek islands is now a humanitarian imperative for the European Union, following the fire at the infamous Maria camp. Francesco Rocca, president of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, said holding refugees for years on end on the Greek islands was no solution to the migratory crisis. The fire which broke out on Tuesday at Greece's largest refugee camp destroyed the official part of the facility which housed 4,000 people. A second blaze on Wednesday destroyed most of the remaining camp where another 8,000 people lived in tents and makeshift shacks around the perimeter. Lesbos is the main port of entry for arrivals in EU member state Greece because of its close proximity to Turkey. We have, I think, let me tell you, 300 families I like. Much on that number. Living on the street, not have food, not have anything. Go inside for Moria. If you find water, you drink. If you not find, you stay thirsty. You stay hungry. This situation is tragic. Because uh, the, all the camp had the burned. Uh, zone 9, Zone uh, 6, all tents. We, uh, now we don't have uh, any food, any tents. Uh, we uh, sleep in the road. It's very, very bad. A huge fire raged in Beirut port on Thursday, sparking alarm among the Lebanese population, still reeling from the devastating explosion of last month. It was not immediately clear what caused the blaze just over a month after the August 4th blast, which killed more than 190 people, wounded thousands and destroyed much of the capital. The interim head of the port, Bassem al Qaisi, told Lebanese television channel LBC that the blaze started in the port's free zone, where an importer had stocked cooking oil containers and tyres. He reported it was either caused by the heat or by a mistake, but noted it was too early to say. And this Thursday, the Secretary General of the Supreme Defence Council of Lebanon, Mahmoud al Asma, reading a statement by the President, announced that those responsible for the huge fire at the Beirut port must be held accountable. Lebanese President Michael On says that today's fire could be an intentional act of sabotage, the result of a technical error, ignorance, or negligence. In all cases, the cause needs to be known as soon as possible, and those responsible held to account. This Thursday, South Africans mourn the death of anti-apartheid lawyer and human rights activist George Bezos, who defended Nelson Mandela and others prosecuted in the Rivonia trial of the 1960s. It's a, a pillar 
of strength for us as an institution, but also um, for, for Madiba in terms of his contribution to the legacy of Madiba. I never did it. I called him uh, the Mokolo, I called him that, which is like a father or grandfather. And that's what he was to me. A sweet uh, person who was firm, very stubborn um, when th there was a need for that. Someone who actually liked a good party too. Um, that uh, he could be the last person to leave. Uh, where my, and uh, to him I say, as you meet Nelson Mandela, tell him that we're trying our best to build the country of your dreams. The new generation that is going to be born, like it, you get some people that will, 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 will be able to live in the footsteps of those kind of people. They are, they are our role models at the very same time, they are our heroes. I, I hope he's not the last of his era. I hope there's many more to come because we need all South Africans to be as he was to understand our differences and work together. It's as simple as that. Mali's military junta on Thursday launched a three-day national consultation with political parties, unions and NGOs as it faces questions at home and pressure from abroad over plans to return the country to civilian rule. Around 500 people are attending the forum, unfolding at a conference centre in the capital of the impoverished West African state, Bamako. The move marks the second round of talks between the young officers who led a coup against President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita on August 18th and civilian representatives, many of whom had campaigned fiercely for him to resign. At stake is how the junta intends to make good on its vow, made just hours after the coup, to restore civilian rule to the country and stage elections within a reasonable time frame. Rising and record-level Nile floodwaters are threatening to swamp an ancient archaeological site in Sudan. Teams have set up sandbag walls and are pumping out water to prevent damage at the ruins of al Bajawari, once a royal city of the two millennia old Merotic Empire. We drained the water from the building next to the royal bath. Then we made up area to prevent water from entering the main stream inside the royal city. And the final stage is to suction the water by pumps and return it to the Nile to dry the ancient city wall as much as possible to keep the site safe. The water annually reached the boundaries of the site protected by concrete columns up to one and a half meters long. And in this year, these columns were flooded with water to a height of more than 1 meter and 20 centimeters. And this is a very high level in relation to the level of the Nile this year. Three months of heavy rain in Niger have left 65 people dead and nearly 330,000 homeless, while several areas of the capital, Niamey, remain underwater. The Ministry of Humanitarian Action and Disaster Management reported on Tuesday that as of September 7th, 51 people had died when their homes collapsed in the floods, while a further 14 had drowned. The worst affected regions are Maradi in the central south of the country, Tahua and Tilaberi in the west, and Dosso in the southwest. At least 10 of the deaths occurred in the capital, where the rain caused the Niger River to break its banks, according to municipal authorities. Niger is one of the world's driest countries and frequently suffers from spells of drought. A report from the United Nations Children's Fund has revealed that the infant mortality rate in India decreased to 34 per 1,000 life births between 1990 and 2019. The Population Division of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the World Bank reported that the mortality rate among children under five years of age dropped from 126 for every 1,000 life births in 1990 to 34 last year. According to the report, the country recorded an annual rate of reduction in the infant mortality rate of 4.5%. The Iranian Navy began a three-day exercise in the Sea of Oman near the strategic Strait of Hormuz on Thursday, deploying an array of warships, drones and missiles. One of the exercise's objectives is to devise tactical offensive and defensive strategies for safeguarding the country's territorial waters and shipping lanes, according to a military statement. The Navy will test fire surface-to-surface -surface and shore-to-sea cruise missiles and torpedoes and rocket launching systems fitted on warships, submarines, aircraft and drones, it added. The exercise's spokesman, Commodore Sharam Irani, said that foreign aircraft, especially U.S. drones, had been warned to steer clear of the area.
And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of our stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.